the 6 p.m. council city does and now convene and the meeting. Tonight's invitation will be given by council member Hanley. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here this evening. Please watch over us as, as uh, we discern the matters of the city and, and, uh, and the large implications that they have for us and, and the excitement around those. And uh, just help us, Father, as we, as we try to make the best decision for, for, our, for our city and, and uh, for all the folks who, who uh, depend on us. Uh, please watch over all of our military men and women as they serve uh, both here and abroad. And we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number two, public hearings. Um, second public hearing on the proposed tax rate with Swagger. Mayor, members of the council, tonight we're here for the second public hearing on the proposed tax rate. The Truth in Taxation and Rules Mandated Governmental Unit published the proposed tax rate and um, hold two public he me hearings on the proposed tax rate. The first public hearing was held Monday or Tuesday, September 3rd, and the second being held tonight during the special call meeting. The tax rate will be adopted at the September 16th meeting. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this agenda item? There being none of the public hearings closed. Questions for council? All right. Agenda item 2B, with the public hearing on the second um, second hearing of the adoption of the 2013-2014 budget, Ms. Wagner. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, we are here for the second public hearing on the adoption of the fiscal year 2014 budget. Once again, the truth and taxation rules mandate that we publish this, um, we publish, um, the proposed operating budget um, that we hold two public hearings, one being held Tuesday, September 3rd, the other tonight, and the budget is on the agenda tonight for adoption. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this agenda item? There being none, the public hearings closed. Question from council. All right, what we're going to do now, if the council's uh, okay, we're going to go to um, these two items for consideration and we'll get back to the uh, information on the. Um, Zone. So agenda item 3A, receive a report on the discussion on the 2014 budget, Ms. Wagner. Mayor, members of the council, we are here tonight to take action with the proposed fiscal year 2014 budget. Um, we've had ongoing meetings since May. Um, the council retreat was held May 17th, and we presented a budget presentation at the council meeting on July 15th, and then again August 5th. Um, the bu budget presentation um, that um, you've seen is an update to any changes that may have occurred since those meetings and any recommendations council may have had stated during those meetings. The city manager has met with all departments and identified priorities and made recommendations based on those priorities. Two public hearings have been held for citizen input and we um, staff recommends um, funding the projects and program enhancements identified in the budget as presented. Questions from council? Motion. Make a motion we approve the budget as presented. Second. Have a motion from Councilman Spindle, second Councilman Regat. All in favor by saying aye. Aye. Opposed by sign. We have uh, one nay. Motion carries. Agenda item 3B. Ms. Wagner. Yes, Mayor and members of the Council. Um, we have a new section in the Chapter 26 Tax Code, 102.007. It requires um, the adoption of a budget um, that re raises more revenue from property taxes than in previous years, requires a vote of the governing body to ratify the property tax increase reflected in the budget, and that's what I've heard watching. Questions from council? Motion. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to... Uh, David Spindle approved the property tax increase of $333,764 as reflected in the budget for the fiscal year 2004. Second. Have a motion from Councilman Spindle, second from Councilman Brawley. All in favor of saying aye. Aye. Opposed uh, like sign. Motion carries. We'll go back to our, our final public hearing of the evening. Public hearing uh, agenda item 2C, public hearing on the um, Tax increment reinvestment zone number two, consider adoption of an ordinance on the first reading. Mr. Hanna. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, 
the, the intention of this public hearing is to allow the developer an opportunity to address council about an item that has been come up for discussion. Um, and it's also to have uh, the public hearing on tax increment reinvestment zone number two, um, which is, as you know, the tax increment reinvestment zone for Preston Harbor. Uh, we have a number of action items for council tonight as an outcome of this particular public hearing. Um, what I'd like for council to do is listen to uh, whoever may speak at the public hearing, and then I would like council to convene into an executive session to consult with their attorney, um, and we'll come out and take whatever action council deems necessary at that point in time. Unless council has any questions for staff directly, uh, that includes staff's report. This is a public hearing. Is there anyone here wishing to speak to this agenda item? Mr. Roder, if you would, yeah. Um, no, I this okay. If you would, please state your name and address for the record, please. Yeah, to. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, I'm Bob Roder. I'm an attorney in McKinney. My office is 1700 Redbud, Suite 300, McKinney, Texas. I'm here on behalf of the owner and the developer of Preston Harbor. Uh, I have with me uh, George Shooter and his wife Gail who represent the ownership group. I also have Ike Shoup with me who's an attorney in Fort Worth uh, who has assisted uh, my team with regard to uh, specifically at this time the TERS matters. Um, you have before you uh, an item uh, involving the adoption of a TERS ordinance that is predicated upon a preliminary plan, a TERS plan. And I'm here tonight on behalf of my client to tell you that as much as we would like to, we cannot support the plan or the ordinance that is before you. I think you've seen us in front of this council, some of you many for many years, some of you maybe this is the first time, but this is a, a project that we've been about in Denison, Texas for uh, 10 years plus. It's an exciting project. It's a project that has a great amount of upside potential but it's a project of very large magnitude. It's a project that's going to take a long period of time. Uh, you have probably reviewed your consultant's feasibility report prepared by uh, Mr. Klein, and you'll see that uh, at this point in time, we're estimating 36 years to just build all of the residential uh, components of this project. It's over 3,100 acres. Um, but our biggest concern with where we are today, and this is a concern we've expressed in at least two significant meetings with your staff and with your, with your consultants and with your attorney, is that uh, the city, according to them, desires to reserve the right to reduce the boundaries of the TERS at any time and for any reason. Let me paint you the picture as to what that means to me. By ordinance, you would create a TERS that would include all 3,100 acres. And that TERS then would create, would capture an increment of city tax that is paid by the property within that 3,100 acres. And that city tax then would go not to pay in advance for things, but would be a source of reimbursement to the developers that come in and put in qualified public infrastructure within the 3,100 acres. Qualified public infrastructure means it's been approved by the TERS board and by the city council. It's part of a TERS plan, the cost of which has been approved. And before any reimbursement can be made, it has to actually have been installed. And the cost, therefore, must have been certified, the improvements inspected by the city. We are looking in this project, and that's reflected in your consultant's project plan, that we're going to spend somewhere in 2013 dollars around 117 million dollars and when we extend them over the 36 years of residential build out that's about 255 million dollars in cost for approved infrastructure projects for that and in addition to that we expect that there will be about four billion dollars in non-project costs. Those include the cost for the structures and the cost for uh, the public improvements that are not part of the TERS qualified plan. 
but so you can see there's going to be a significant amount of investment that would be required to bring this project to fruition. For that, just to put the cherry on the, on the soda for you, for that, this project at build out will have generated a combined $5.2 billion in revenue to the city, the school district, and the county, of which the city's take is a little over a billion dollars. This is ad valorem taxes that you will collect, sales taxes you will collect, in addition to what is whatever is paid for reimbursement of the cost of that public infrastructure. Now, I've said all this to try to explain to you the magnitude of the project and the fact that it is a project that's going to have multiple developments over a many years period of time. I also hope that these numbers uh, paint the picture that in order for someone, some developer, some development company to invest these kinds of dollars, they've got to have some certainty about the sources of repayment for the qualified reimbursements. You know, I gave the city manager last week a memorandum that I'm assuming he's distributed to you that talked about the need for certainty in this level of investment. And I simply want to reiterate again to you that nobody is going to invest a dollar in the development of this property for qualified project infrastructure or otherwise if the mechanisms we have set up, that is the mud district and the TERS, uh, are not there to reimburse them over the long time, long term, by retaining the right unilaterally and without cause to shrink the boundaries of the TERS to only cover 100 acres or 1,000 acres or 2,000 acres creates a level of an uncertainty in terms of what the basis for recovery is going to be because everything within that TERS is what the development community is going to rely upon as part of the reimbursement pool going forward. It's been said to us in every meeting we have that the city council is adamant that it's not going to give up any city rights. And in, in the abstract, I understand and appreciate that. But let me just submit to you that you have already given up city rights in this process. You have given up a city right to set the increment and change it from time to time. You set it and you've agreed that it'll be set for all times during the length of the tours. That's a, you could have reserved the right to change it as you so desired, but I think you saw the need for it to be established so there is some basis for us to be able to uh, project what the opportunities for reimbursement would be. Um, you have, um, let me see, you've also, um, you know, given up the right to um, decide the scope of the project plan. We, we have a preliminary plan that sets out the basic infrastructure that's in there that's going to be subject to qualified, to being qualified project costs. Granted, we have to, you know, get that bid and get those costs in and everything, but you've given up that right already in, in terms of our agreements. So this concept of, of absoluteness just doesn't function in this environment with this kind of occurs. I've worked on lots of turges that are very small in scope, very short in length of time, and in those kinds of things it's pretty easy to say, I know exactly what it's going to cost to put in this infrastructure, I know that I'm going to have a build out in four years or ten years. That kind of thing is pretty easy to tie a ribbon around and everybody agree to. In this particular case, we need your commitment that you're going to be there with us long term for the TERS to cover all 3,100 acres. That's our big holdup at this point in time. There's some, some smaller issues out there uh, about interest uh, that goes on and I want to assure you that in our discussions with the city manager, we have assured him that we have never intended to collect interest on interest and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I think we have a, a, a general understanding about that. But, but this is a real sticking point for us. And until we can resolve this issue, we're not prepared to support the ordinance that's before you or the preliminary plan that's before you. Now, we have submitted a preliminary plan uh, to your uh, city manager. We think that the preliminary plan is a fair plan. We think that it identifies all of the elements that need to be in the preliminary plan. Uh, one of the things that has been suggested to us by, the city, by your city attorney is that we don't need all these details 
going forward in the preliminary plan. And I submit to you that if we don't hash the details out at the beginning, we're going to have, it's not going to look good for any of us to try to hash them out after the fact. We want the details decided up front so we all know going forward what the deal is. So um, we have before us a tremendous opportunity. We have before us a unique project. I looked at the project plan and, and your consultant said that the city population has not grown in 50 years. And uh, jobs mean growth to most cities. The uniqueness of this property is it's not going to be dependent upon jobs. These are going to be second homes. These are going to be retirement homes. Jobs are not going to be the driving factor for this. So there's a great benefit to you as well as to my client to move this project forward. But at this point in time, Mr. Mayor, we're stuck. It would be our request that you uh, table this item, that you continue the public hearing until we've had an opportunity to resolve that critical issue. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Bob, is there anyone else from your team that's going to speak tonight? No, sir, unless you need a resource person. Mr. Chief is here to do so. Um, questions for Mr. Chief, or sorry, for Mr. Roder? If the limits is the problem, why would the state legislature set those up? I mean, what's the reason? Tell me why we should give that up. I mean, there's got to be projects out here of this scope, this size, out the state somewhere that has this length of time. I don't think this is totally unusual to the only project that may happen now or in the near future. Uh, Mr. Spin, is it Spindell or Spindell? Spindle. Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll try to keep it above board here. Um, to my knowledge, there's not another project of this type out there. Here's what sets this one apart. I can I can give you a number of examples of large land masses, 3,000 acres, that are in a municipal utility district. But in virtually every one of those instances, they are extraterritorial jurisdiction muds. When this project agreed to come into the city, the offset between the true double taxation was that there would be a curves put in place with a city increment that would go to help offset the district expense so that your citizens out there would not be paying a full city tax and a full mud tax. I am unaware of any project in the state of Texas, and I, I must tell you, I do not know every one of them, but I'm unaware of any project of this size that is an in-city mud. I still, I mean, why would, why does the state legislature put this in place? Why should we waive something they put in place? So that's my question, not whether there's others out here like this. Well, it, it is, it's a right, but it's like any other rights you have. You have a right to change the increment too, but you agreed to establish it. I, in my opinion, you have to measure the value of what you're given in the absolute against what it takes to get a project done. And I would I would submit to you that if we turn the if we turn the uh, the orange around and we looked at the other end of it, the question might be what is it that you are giving up by agreeing to not uh, modify the terms in the future to not reduce the boundaries? You're not required to spend a penny. There's nothing that's going to come out of the city coffers. The only thing that's going to happen is for every dollar that the city collects, 34 cents is going to go in the TERS fund, and that money is not going to be spent until there have been actual dollars spent in public infrastructure that's been qualified ahead of time and to be used as a reimbursement. So, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say no harm, no foul, but it's one of those situations that if, if my client needs the certainty of knowing that that TERS won't be reduced, is that worth giving up uh, given what your downside risk is? And uh, try to keep my answer no longer than that. So, so well, I, would, I mean, again, being that this is a 40 or 50 year time and, and, and the unknowns, the uncertainties that you talked about, you know, what, what protects the city, you know, 10, 15, 40 years from now? If the developer doesn't come through with all the the terms that, that, that are set forth, I mean, there, there's escape hatches for both sides. Um, so, so I mean, is that not the part of the intent of the legislation and the statutory right of the city? 
I think the legislation was very broadly written. Uh, to, to think that a lot of legislation is written with people looking at the unintended consequences, I think, is to overstate what happens in the legislative writing committees. But it, here is here is a what I consider to be a, a real world or answer to your request. I don't see my client or any other developer spending money to put infrastructure in the ground unless there's going to be development that follows it, right? Because just having water lines and streets out there is meaningless unless you have a market to sell the land that you have developed uh, to, to users. And so I don't, I don't see a situation arising where my clients put a lot of money in the ground and nothing's happened. I see the money going in the ground when we know things are gonna happen. So I don't see the city being left out there holding the bag. Now, if nothing ever happens and that turf sits out there for 50 years, then the increment that the city is going to have captured in that TERS account is 32 or 34 percent of a little lot of nothing because that property today does, just doesn't generate any tax. So, so on, the, on the flip side of that, um, you, know, you, you don't see your, your client putting in the infrastructure. Uh, we don't see the council ever collapsing the turfs. You know, uh, again, you're talking about a a, a, a you know one percent thing that may occur, and we're talking about a one percent thing that may occur. I mean, the likelihood of either scenario is just way off the chart here, right? So, so we've got to we've got to come to the realization that it's not in the best interest of the developer to do what you just described, and no developer would do that. It would never be in the best interest of the city to collapse the TERS when we're talking about being able to generate all the positives that we've already known and you've so eloquently rehashed for us tonight, right? I mean, in the and, and so, let's follow along with that line of reasoning. If I'm telling you that it's imperative that we have the 1% chance removed, what problem is it? Well, I guess it would be the 1% chance that the city has that we don't want to have that issue for us, right? I mean, it, it, it's it's the equal argument whether you're on the, the side of the, the developer or the city is the way I'm interpreting what you're saying. And, and I would disagree with that to this extent. The city has to do nothing. The city just sits there, approves projects, and collects money. Okay. My right. client has to take the affirmative action of actually okay. investing. So, so unless unless we get to a point where we start phase one is successful and the city has to start providing services, out eight or nine miles outside of our city center, of which now it's not costing the city nothing. It's good. I mean, we're providing a level of service, right? So uh, it, that level of service is based on the, the, the financial picture that we've seen that you guys projected, um, and that's the home run. But it's in the event that, uh oh, things aren't working, the market's changing 20 years from now, and, and we've got our 1% that, that may occur, or you got your one percent. I still think that because of the, the length of the time we have, we we both are trying to be protected here. We cannot be protected with you reserving that right. I mean, I, I don't know how I can say it any okay. plain than that. I okay. do think that part of the consideration that went into the increment. Remember, the increment is only with your M and O has nothing to do with your I and S, and um, and it was sized. I'm going to assume, and I was told that it was sized so that you guys would have a comfort level that you could cover the cost of providing services out there. I mean, you know, the, the infrastructure that is required is not only roads, water line, sewer line, storm sewer, but we're also required to build you a fire station or two. We're also required to provide police uh, facilities. So in terms of your capital cost, the way that it's been negotiated on behalf of the city, you, you have no capital cost. You might, you, you're gonna have some operations cost, but if you have 100 people out there, your operations are gonna be sized for 100 people. You're not gonna staff it for 10,000. No, we understand. Sir, one of the things that I guess I've, I've, I've taken a little bit of, of an exception to in the in this theory, and, and I think actually, I think to some extent I take exception on on behalf of Mr. Schuler's, 
you know, the, the, the concept of certainty is, is something that is, that is really difficult. And if this project was certain, you know, Mr. Schuler would be fighting for the opportunity to do this project. I mean, Mr. Schuler's taking a tremendous risk, which he has done I, as successful as he has been, I, has taken risks his entire life to, you know, to make these kind of projects happen. And I guess that's the thing that uh, that I'm struggling with because you know the the question of well we need this certainty to, to happen well the city doesn't have the certainty and the you know your client does have the the, the distinct advantage that should this development be successful as as I'm sure it will be you know all of those costs are going to be refunded to him you know, reimbursed to him which allows you know for for you know quite a quite a bargain in that standpoint because I understand there's you're exactly right with 255 million dollars of, of infrastructure over that time frame but on the same token that's a pretty good deal to get all that money back and I don't see where the city would ever have the incentive to collapse a you know a uh, you know a, a project of this size that would be so beneficial and you know I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm just not sure with the concept of certainty, I mean, there's no certainty that we're going to get $4 billion. And that, in fact, that number is double what I had heard originally that this project was going to be closer to $2 billion of, of, of increased value yeah, out there. Everything including the school and. Oh, okay. I can yeah, I saw the text. I can understand. So, uh, but, <clears throat> but I guess that's the, you know, that's the, that's where I'm struggling with this is the, the, the need for the certainty because. You know, I, I, it doesn't strike me that Mr. Schuler is, is is wanting certainty because that's where that's where the risk and that's where the the, uh, the ability to make the money and, and, and have the, the great returns. You know, and, and I guess that's the part that's really been bothering me some is just this this concept of being certainty because I just I don't think it exists. Well, Mr. Hanley, if I might, um, I I think uh, perhaps you've misread the type of certainty that I'm talking about. It's not the certainty of a return on your investment. It's a certainty of knowing the methodology by which you can compute the return on your investment. And so if we know that the TURG is gonna be there, then we have a methodology or a mechanism for uh, recovery. If we don't know whether it's gonna be there or not, albeit a 1% chance, then that is the uncertainty that I'm talking about. Uh, but I, I don't think you would argue though, and I think partly of, on the non-certainty part of Mr. Hanna's thoughts there that this the ability for a developer to recoup recoup 255 million dollars of infrastructure is a sweetheart deal if you if you take that in an absolute term I would agree with you what you're not taking into consideration is there is going to be interest at, at loss of value of whatever he has invested over that entire period of time and so you can take $255 million, you can put it on a 36-year amortization, you can apply whatever interest rates you want to, 2%, 4%. At the end of the day, he's getting back a small part of the $255 million. I mean, that's just the way the math works, at least as I do it. Right. Well, the, the, and I'm not going to argue that point. Other questions? Uh, a question on the uh, additional 117 million. Is that an addition to what you've already spent this year with property? And what's could you elaborate a little more on what's what's going to be invested there as an additional? The 117 million are is a number reflected in 2013 dollars of the value or the cost of the infrastructure that has been described in your consultant's uh, feasibility plan which would be the roads, the main water lines, the main sewer lines, all of that stuff, is what the $117 million represents. If it were to all be put in today, that's how much it would cost. We anticipate putting it in over a period of time, and that's why when you, when you do that and you run the escalated cost over time, that's where the $255 million comes in. Okay. So what's, is there an planned investment in 2013 related to this $117 million? Not. For 2013, no, we, is we, 14? I, not to my knowledge. Good thing. I can't answer that. We're planning to have a charrette that will help identify sort of the current uh, potential uses for the property. 
the level of, uh, of interest. I think in our, in the uh, project plan that we submitted and in the feasibility study, we anticipated that there, there really wouldn't be any development out there for about four years. Um, Bob, I guess one other thing is as we look at, at the deal and the ability for of what that $255 million represents, um, the other thing is the special legis legislation that, that we supported that allows the in-city mud, um, and then when we get to, you know, 25% of the, of the valuations get out there and we're able to, um, and the mud's created, those revenues again will be able to come back to pay the developer. Um, so again, it's not just TERS revenue that the developer's going to be the recipient of here. That, that's exactly right, Mayor. Absolutely. So. I mean, but it, again, uh, we're, we're talking about a piece of property that you've got to create a demand. You've got to, as I said, it's unique. We're not going to have people live there because there's an employment center right next door. We're going to have to bring people in. Fantastic project. Other questions? Thank you, Bob. Thank you for the opportunity to address each other. Oh, okay, Karen's still open. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak to this agenda item? There being none, the public hearing. Uh, sir. Yes, sir. Come on, come on forward. I thought possibly uh, the city's advisors might speak in open session. I thought possibly. Name, name and address, please, for the record. Ben Mr. Madison, uh, 301 West Porter, Dennis. Uh, I think the citizens of this community have a right to know what the other side of the argument is in public. Why is this being done? Behind closed doors. Well, I think I think the answer to that is anytime we're looking at uh, real estate transactions and legal legal transactions, council has a right to be in executive session discussions. I'm not denying the negotiations. Right. It's a policy matter. I've been there where every one of you all are. But also, I know that this is the first time that I've heard this project discussed out in the open. And the issues that you heard on one side, what is the public policy for not allowing our citizens and the media to hear the other side? I don't deny the legal right. Well, I think that's the point that Mr. Munson is that it is a legal right and the council desires to take advantage of I'm not speaking to the council as a lawyer. I think the citizens of Denison have a right to form in their minds the pros and cons of this project. And to my knowledge, it's never been discussed in public. And I just speak as one citizen. It's highly complex. But why would you deny the citizens the right to know what's going on? And, and I wouldn't. I would say that we're not denying the right. Um, certainly, when um, this is a public document that we filed with the city clerk, that we're perhaps taking action on tonight. That um, that when we do take action, you know, then, then we'll be able to fully disclose exactly what we're discussing. I mean, One of the most serious decisions for the future of this town that I'm, I'm aware of. Why are you doing it behind closed doors? Mr. Why? Munson, Mr. Munson, I think one of the reasons why is because the developer could use the language that their legal counsel provides counsel about any risk. They could take that and then use it against the counsel from a, from a negotiation standpoint. We are in the middle of a negotiation. We're talking about oh. millions of dollars. And I think the counsel has a need, not a right, but a need to visit with their legal advisors in executive session, which is why the state of Texas gave them the ability to do that. With all due respect, Mr. Hanna, there have been many, many executive sessions, many, many closed door meetings. Why don't the citizens get to know about it? 
And what is the downside for the good of this city? For the citizens to be able to hear both sides of the argument. I'd like to make a couple of other points. Okay. I've been involved in a number of economic development projects. And the biggest difference in this one is that Mr. Shearer has bought the land. You don't, he doesn't have the leverage in this situation that most developers would have. You all may be aware that the city of Sherman is looking at another very significant project. It's not going to happen if these negotiations are not carried out in a manner that will make it economic for the risk capital to be invested. This man has done everything he said he was going to do. Would you or I have invested money in this uh, pretty rough terrain? We've all lived here all our lives and we wouldn't even consider taking that kind of risk even on a much smaller level. He stepped out and did that. He spent his money in good faith taking forward and now when he comes and I've been involved in real estate for many, many years. I'm involved in projects south of here and in this area. This is truly one of the highest risk projects I can imagine. Who is going to live out there and how is that going to be promoted? We in Denison, America, are just blessed that we have a man that wants to take that kind of risk with his capital. Secondly, he's got to go raise funds. You all know in any bond covenant, any transaction this city does, if there are any loopholes, they're taken out. They're addressed up front before you get a commitment for a dime. And he's going to be in that same position. If he is able to do it, and there is a 1% chance, as we talked about, it's going to cost more money. Because who's going to bear the risk? You think the investors, the people that are the lenders, Mr. Spindle? You price your loans according to risk. Or we should take the risk. They do take the risk. That's the point. That's exactly the point. And if we increase the risk, if the collateral, the borrowers should pay for it. The risk increases, that's right. So what if it reduces the potential of this project being developed? That's his problem? Is side, that his problem, Mr. Spindle? On the lender side, you price the risk. You ask me on the lender side, Mr. Munson. Thank if you're on the lender side, and Mr. Shearer's coming to you for a loan, and there's a 1% chance that the source of his repayment could be reduced or impaired, I'm sorry, I'm not following your argument. What is the risk to the city of Denison? We've got nothing. What in the world are we risking? I've heard a few nuances here. But look at the, we are very close to sending a bad message for economic development in our community. Very close. As I mentioned uh, before, the details must be drilled down as far as they can be up front. How many projects have you all seen that have gone busted? How many builders do you know, Mr. Beck, that have gone broke? 
the one percents have killed a lot of people and a lot of projects. And what is the risk to this city other than you're just saying we can do it? We can do it. This isn't any game. Our future is at stake. Our tax rates are sky high. Our school taxes are sky high. And then I hear you, Mayor, talking about what a wonderful project this is. And then I hear your comments tonight. And they sound real positive. I'm just concerned. And now we're going to go in the closet. We're going to listen to somebody that I know is anti-development. We went through a zoning ordinance. We went through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for bad advice that cost this city a lot of money. Bless God that Robert Hanna came along and you on the council and it reversed a lot of those trends. But you all know that this team and this advisor was part of that program that was unrealistic. A South Lake cookie cutter, I would suggest. This is the same group that I heard say we shouldn't have any gated communities. I've heard a number of other examples. All of this is kept pushed under the table. It's so complicated, average citizen can't understand it. But they are looking hard for a job. They're having a hard time paying their taxes. And I don't like this council going into the closet to decide what legal loophole they can use that might reduce the chances of this project coming to fruition. I know you all pray hard on your decisions tonight, and I appreciate you letting me come in. Um, I, I do just want to speak to one, one comment that you said of, of we're close to, to send a, a terrible message. And I think the track record of this community and the success that this community's had over the last several years in the areas of economic development would speak to just the opposite of that. Um, and secondly, that, that when a community is willing to put $255 million back into the developer because of his risk, then that's a statement that says we're very... That's not the community's money, sir. That's generated by this development. Tax revenue. Yes, sir. We're sitting out here with ag land. We won't even have a dream of the 255. I don't follow the reasoning. This is outside the city limits. I mean, they've petitioned to be annexed to do this project. Maybe they don't come to the city. Maybe they stay outside the city. I think you're sending a terrible message. And when the citizens have a little more insight, we'll see their reaction. Any other comments? Okay, that being so, the public hearing is closed. Council now will convene an executive session to Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code to discuss deliberations regarding economic development negotiations pursuant to Section 551.087 on the Preston Harbor development. The time is 6.43.